Hello, welcome to the CRAW, the 15th virtual undergrad town hall, town hall event. Uh, I'm Lori Pollack from the University of Delaware, and today we have a PhD student uh, in bioinformatics from UNC Charlotte. Uh, it's Anita Appal, and she's going to be talking about a knowledgeable, uh, a knowledge base analysis of Roseberry officinalis. So let me tell you a little bit about Anita. She is a second year PhD student at UNC Charlotte in bioinformatics. Uh, she received her undergrad degree in biotechnology from RIT in 2015 and then moved on to her master's at UNC Charlotte and is now working in the PhD program where she's combining both the wet lab science and computational biology. Uh, so she's got a combination. Uh, it's a very interdisciplinary uh, uh, field with both biology and computer science. So I'm going to let it over to Anita for uh, first a research talk with, followed by a question and answer session where you are able to, at any point in time actually during this webinar, you can input questions in the Q&A panel on the right hand side of your screen. Um, and we will give those questions to Anita. Uh, then we will be followed following that question and answer session by a mentoring session and some more question and answer. And finally, after the formal webinar, we will end with uh, about a half an hour, up to a half an hour of online chat. So welcome, Anita. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. Okay. So the essential oil industry has been vastly growing in the past couple of years. It exceeded over $6 billion in 2015, and as I'm sure you guys have noticed, that there's a huge growth in consumer demand for essential oils. You're seeing them in grocery stores. People are selling them online on social media, um, and there's an increased growth for all natural products and plant-based products. So this has allowed a lot of different companies to start producing essential oils, but this can be kind of an issue because essential oils are not FDA regulated. And when something is not FDA regulated, there's no standards put in place before it enters the marketplace. So this really gives companies their own freedom to decide what their own standards are. And this can be dangerous because essential oils basically are a concoction of different chemical compounds. So there's good to it and there's bad to it. So I just wanted to get an idea of the audience here. Um, I just want to see which of you have used essential oils or have, are currently using essential oils. Um, a, I use them all the time, or B, I've used them a couple times, or C, I know what they are, but I've never used them, or D, I don't know much about them at all. Um, like I said, I just wanted to get an idea. Maybe some of you use them all the time and know everything about essential oils, or maybe some of you have never used any at all. So um, this will kind of give me a scope to see kind of what the audience is, their background is on essential oils. So, um, so essential oils are basically a volatile compound. So they're extracted from the essential oil itself, from the plant itself. And it can come from the flowers or the shrubs or the roots. So they're really interesting um, molecules. And the poll has ended, and hopefully I'll see your answers in a second. Okay, so about 50% of you have used them about a couple times, and the majority of you guys know what they are, but you've never used them. So that's super interesting. Um, so like I said, an essential oil is basically um, a mix of volatile compounds that are extracted from the plant. So depending on what essential oil it is, it can be... Um, part of the, the shrubs or the flowers or the seeds or the roots. Um, it really just depends. Every single essential oil is different. Um, there are some main methods to produce essential oils, and some of these include um, some type of steam distillation method, um, which requires some type of steam that gets injected into the plant in order to release the oil molecules from the plant. Um, another method is cold pressed extraction, which is typically how we get oils from um, citrus fruits. So we just apply a large amount of pressure onto the rinds of the fruit, and the essential oils will basically seep out of the rinds. 
Um, and then sometimes, in some cases, we need to add some type of solvent in order to get the plant to release its essential oil. So depending on where the plant is grown, when it's harvested, the process that's been it's been going through during the cultivation can all affect the chemical profile of that essential oil. Um, so what's cool is essential oils can contain many different chemicals. They can contain um, phenols, alcohols, ethers, esters, sesquidipines, and many more. So they are full of different chemicals. So the current research on essential oils is growing, but it is a very small subset compared to a more popular topic. You go online and you look up rheumatoid arthritis, you're going to get over 200,000 research studies. But you look up something like essential oils and you only have about 16,000. Um, there are a lot more essential oil studies on some of the more popular oils, like lavender or lemon, um, but there's still a vast majority of missing studies on widely used essential oils that may not be as common of a plant. So are these claims what they said to be? Can these oils be used to target and treat specific diseases? Um, that's basically what my research wants to look into. Um, can we you know, make some type of conclusion from the chemical components of a plant, look at how it affects gene expression, find out what metabolic pathway it's involved in, and possibly target a disease. So some rosemary applications, according to a traditional reference guide, so as you know, there are a bunch of apps and books that tell you what to use an essential oil for. But some of these reference books lack actual solid scientific evidence of it being known to work for that health ailment. So rosemary is said to be great for arthritis, muscle cramps due to its possible anti-inflammatory properties. Um, it's great for mental fatigue. It can possibly be used to prevent Alzheimer's, which is a big claim. It has anti-cancer properties. And can, can rosemary do all these things? I mean, it's possible, but why and what is it doing mechanistically? So rosemary essential oil is made up about 50% 1 8 cineal. It's a very common herb and plant that's been used for thousands of years. So this can vary the chemical profile of rosemary depending on obviously where it's grown and there are different chemotypes or variations of rosemary, but we're gonna focus on this one that has about 50% 1 8 cineal. So what can we find out about rosemary knowing that it's basically mostly 1,8-cineal, and then you also have a good chunk of CAM4, and also have a good chunk of alpha-pinene. So we hypothesized that using bioinformatics approaches, we can learn the possible health effects of rosemary essential oil based on its chemical constituents. So what I use a lot in my research is linguamatics. It's a text mining tool that allows me to write complex queries in order to text mine effectively and accurately. Um, so this picture right here is just an example of an average query that I've created. So in that blue box on the right is just one query, but on the left you'll see it's actually one of nested, I don't know, 14 different queries I have in there. Um, this can be very difficult because, as you know, G names are, you know, it can be MYP, but that could be an acronym for something completely different. So having to write these queries in a way that pulls out the information I need, that's pulling out information accurately, can get very difficult. Um, linguamatics is great, but I have to tell it specifically what to look for. So here's an example of things I have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, I was looking for chemical gene associations, and here the software picked up what it thought was activate, gene chemical association activate, but what it really picked up was antimicrobial activity. So it picked up the activity, but not in the right context. Um, so that, I spent a lot of my time reducing that error or that noise, as we call it. So that takes a lot of time. And into our next poll, um, I just want to get an idea of how many of you understand what gene expression data is. Um, a, I totally understand, B, I don't have much of a biology background, or C, I know a little bit. Um, bioinformatics is uh, very heavy biology-based as it is computer science, so I'm just trying to gauge and get an idea of what you guys may know. 
So how many of you guys have a basic understanding of gene expression data? Totally understand, don't really have much of a biology background, or you know a little bit. I know a little bit, and I don't have much of a biology background. Okay, that's totally fine. Um, to make things short and, and sweet, I'll be sure to go over that um, in the next slide after I explain some of this. So this picture right here focuses on my entity relationship diagram. It basically gives the outline of what my, di or my database contains. Um, it has a lot more now, but um, this was started at the basics of what I was building. So you can see in different tables, so up on the left-hand corner, I have plant species and essential oils. Below, I have gene and chemical associations. And up in the middle, I have chemicals of essential oils. Below it, I have CAG gene info. So um, CAG is a database that has a lot of pathway information. Um, and below it, I have gene info. So I have information on the different types of genes that are in my database, what species they come from, what type of, they have a gene ID. And then up on the top right-hand corner, I have some microarray data, which is gene expression data. And below it, I have comparative toxogenomic database. Um, it's a database that has its own chemical gene associations. So I was actually using it to compare it to what I got from text mining and everything else. So basically, to keep things short and sweet, microarray data is basically a data set where they looked at gene expression after adding rosemary essential oil to their isolates, their experimental isolates. So they basically measure what genes it affected and how and by what amount. So if something increases gene expression, then you're going to get more of that protein. And if something decreases the gene expression, you're going to produce less of that protein. So it can kind of tell you how it's interacting with the genes in your body. So taking a closer look at Rosemary, we have these microarray data sets. So we can see what genes are over and under expressed. And then we can also use linguamatics to text find its own chemical gene associations. And then we can kind of combine the both and see if we can find associated pathways that might be in common with these chemical components. So this is just some examples from my database. So these were some gene chemical interactions that I was able to put together from text mining. And then as you can see, I've connected it to um, the database, the KEG database, and then that will tell me what pathway it's associated with. So I basically have all these different tables with different info, and I'm overlapping them to find these connections. So I can use this microarray database and these studies to look at a specific gene, as you can see in that bottom picture. So HMGCR, um, I can look at that. It, it has a slightly higher expression level because it's 1.7. Anything over 1.5 is what they consider to be overexpressed. So it's telling me it's overexpressed. It might be involved in those specific chemicals, terpenes, monoterpenes, camphors. And then it also tells me what um, chemical pathways it's associated with, so bile secretion, um, terpenoid backbone, biosynthesis. So I basically did that with all of my data. I connected it to the microarray studies. I connected it to the chemical components. And I connected it to linguamatics. And I intersected them. And I found that 1,8-cineol and limonene increased expression in these different genes. So as you can see, 1,8-cineol, um, which is the main component of rosemary, um, increased expression in Bax and BCL2. Those two genes are, play a key role in colorectal, small cell, lung, and prostate cancer. And then they also increase expression in IL-10, which is an anti-inflammatory cytokine, which plays a role in many different other associated pathways. Um, it increased expression in MME, which is an enzyme that breaks down beta amyloid, or what you find in the brain of people with Alzheimer's. It also increased expression in those two other genes below that as well. So basically, it gave me a gene set that I can kind of work with further. So it's given me a little bit of this is what rosemary might be possibly doing. So now that I know from the microarray studies, these are the genes that are affected, I can go back and see where it found it in the literature. 
So here I was looking at specifically IL-10. We can see that it increased expression of the gene by 3.86, which is pretty high for a fold change in expression levels. So I then went back and said, okay, where did it pull it out from with the literature? And I can see where Linguomatics pulled it out from. It pulled it out from a study that looked at essential oils and its constituents of eucalyptal and alpha terpenol. And I was looking at bacterial vaginosis in mice. So you can actually pinpoint it all the way down into the article that's highlighted. And it says it increased expression of the anti-inflammatory cytokine IL-10. So that's where the text mining is making the connection with 1-8-Cineal, which is also known as eucalyptal. Um, so it's really interesting that I can now connect the dots with scientific proof. So even though this study is actually looking at a completely different essential oil, its main component is eucalyptal. So that can also now be applied to rosemary if it has a similar chemical profile. It's not going to give us solid results, but it can start to teach us more than what we know about rosemary. So I definitely need more data before any solid conclusions can be drawn, but this does give us scientists, because I do work in wet lab, it gives us a basic gene set that we can work with further. So now that I know these might be the pathways involved with rosemary, I can save a lot of money by saying, okay, let's pinpoint these specific pathways before we spend a bunch of money looking at all these other areas and we don't really know what direction to go in. So it increased expression of IL-10, which is an anti-inflammatory cytokine. Um, it was involved in a P53 mediated apoptosis, which is a can cell cancer pathway. And then it also increased um, expression of MME, which is metalendopeptidase, which is an enzyme that breaks down beta amyloid. As we know, beta amyloid is what builds up in the brain of Alzheimer's patients and causes those tangles of the neuron fibers in their brain. So if this is driving up the expression, of an enzyme that's breaking down the beta amyloid, could it be used as possible prevention for Alzheimer's? It, it would be worth investigating. Um, so this enzyme or this evidence does support a lot of the claims for rosemary essential oil, but it does give researchers now a farther gene set that they can study with further. Further, and now they can look more into the experimental side of this. And some of my future work is obviously to keep building my database, um, eliminate noise. Um, I'm constantly looking for errors in my database. Um, there also is a lot more expression data. I can add a drug bank database is a database that has all information on chemicals and what prescription medications they're in. So that's something I've actually been working on right now to add to my database. I also have my own wet lab studies and RNA sequencing that I plan to add. And you could possibly add machine learning algorithms to this and give the algorithm a specific chemical profile of an essential oil that's never been studied and see what it pulls out from similar chemical profiles of other species of plants. Um, there's a lot to add to it, and this is basically the foundation of some of my dissertation work. Um, but I picked rosemary to kind of see how it could be applied to a single essential oil. And those are some of my acknowledgments, my PI. Do you guys have any questions? Yes, of course we do. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, th thank you for the interesting talk. I have a couple of questions that have come in and a couple of my own. Often, what, one of the questions we usually ask our speakers is how, how did you find this research topic? How did you find, how did you identify this as your PhD topic? So, um, of course, somebody tried to sell me essential oils. So um, I decided to buy some. I'm a pretty open-minded person, and I started using them for everything that, you know, they tell you to use it for, stomach ache, this and that, and I was noticing a difference. So I was like, okay, these work. These people aren't crazy, but what are they doing? So, you know, I went over to the research side. I went to NCBI PubMed, and I started reading all the studies, and that's when I noticed that there wasn't that much out there. There was a good amount to know that these oils do something, but there wasn't enough to make solid conclusions. So I was like, this looks like a great area to go in. Let me see if I can find a professor that will support this idea. And that's 
I met with my PI and he was like, yeah, you can come to my lab and study essential oils. And here I am. <laughs> ah, very interesting. So that's a, that leads me to um, a second question is, uh, what kind, uh, this is a very interdisciplinary uh, area. So what kind of advisor or advisors do you have? Like, how did you find advisors for this? Um, so my PI is a bioinformatician, and most of his uh, colleagues and research associates are bioinformaticians. Most of them are computational-based. Um, I am very lucky that we have a North Carolina research campus, it's called. So I'm on a research campus with NC State, UNC Chapel Hill, and um, the David Murdoch Research Institute. So um, there's a lot of industry companies here as well as academia-based researchers. Um, so luckily, I've been working with a pharmaceutical company that tests um, pharmaceuticals on the skin. So I've also been very lucky to, they have allowed me to use their equipment, their protocols to test a lot of my essential oils on the wet lab side. So um, that has been phenomenal, but not always an option, but luckily it was there for me. So. Okay, so uh, are your so you say they're bioinformatics professors? Are they where? What department are they in? So if someone wanted to find a bioinformatics professor, where would they find such a person? Right. So we are in the College of Computing and Informatics. So we're still with all the comp sci, software engineering, all of those majors. But our department is bioinformatics specifically. So we have about twenty something faculty members that are all specifically bioinformatics scientists. So everyone has some type of coding skill set added on to what type of wet lab they may have. Um, that doesn't mean all of our professors have wet labs either. Some of them are purely computational and don't have wet labs, and then you get some that are hybrid that have both. Um, so it really just depends. But um, not every school has bioinformatics majors. Um, not every school has many bioinformatics professors either. So um, you have to find, if you're interested in going into bioinformatics for grad school or something like that, you do need to find um, a school that has probably its own department and its own um, segregated research if you want to really succeed in there. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So how do you prepare yourself for this kind of research? What kinds of courses are, like, very valuable to have to do this kind of research? So we do, I have met people in my master's program and PhD program that came from computer science backgrounds. Um, so if you come from a coding background, your master's or PhD will be more heavily based in biology um, because you do need a strong background, um, biology, molecular biology, um, biochemistry as well. So you'll take a lot of those classes if you have the computer science background. Now, if you're like me and you come from a bio background, you take all the coding classes. So I had to take a lot of classes on programming machine learning, statistics, databases, and all of the computational classes. So they do kind of gear it depending on what background you're coming into the program in. If you come in with a strong coding set, they're not going to make you take coding classes again. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. Um, so going back to your actual research, uh, you used a tool or piece of software, I guess it's called, uh, called Linguomatic. Correct. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what other problems Linguomatics is used for? Like um, so Linguomatics is a really cool software tool. Um, it isn't cheap, I will be honest with that, but um, it, a lot of pharmaceutical companies actually use it. So the way the software works is you can, what they call index, any type of data set into it. So I took all of NCBI PubMed and put it into the software, and that's what it text mines from. So it's a really cool platform because you can put handwritten notes in there as well as many other um, – it depends on what files you have. If you have handwritten notes, they'll take those. They'll take XMLs. Um, a lot of healthcare professionals are using it for um, text mine through doctor's notes. Um, a lot of people, pharmaceuticals, are using it to text the mind through um, blogs where people record their adverse side effects to try to find new ways to repurpose drugs. Um, people are using it to text mine through social media. Um, so depending on what you feed it, it will text mine through. Okay, so for the people who may, 
be listening who might not know exactly what you mean when you say text mine. Can you give examples of what you mean when you say text mining? Um, so text mining would be at basically searching between any, it can be any type of document in today's society, I guess. We didn't have the, the technology or the natural language processing it to understand a lot of unstructured data as we do now. So um, it does have a lot of natural language processing built into the software to extract relationships from basically any type of text you feed it. So um, yeah, I think one of the coolest things is that it can text mine through handwritten notes as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so um, one of the things we always have to do when we're doing research is, is verify that our approach is working. Uh, what does it mean to verify that your approach is working in your sense? Like, how do you know if it's going wrong or working well? Um, I think, well, being able to trace it all back is very helpful. So the way I connect it all between my database, um, like I said, I can figure out where it's pulling the information from. That doesn't mean it doesn't ever pull incorrect information because it does. <laughs> like I said, um, text mining is extremely difficult and I do get noise built in there. Um, so being able to track it back to each database and figure out where it comes from um, helps a lot. Um, like I said, it's not always right and that happens and the only thing I can do is try to improve my queries or the, the other thing people always ask me too is how do you know it's pulling from a good study? You don't. <laughs> I mean, we all know there are good studies and there are bad studies. And the only way to do that is once I get to the point of looking into the study and then I get the full study and I read the study, then I really find out whether it's a good study or not. So um, it gives you a good idea on where to start, but you will have to go into the nitty gritty details of those findings to see whether it's a good result or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right, I think we will move on to the mentoring session, so we have plenty of time for that. Okay. Okay. So making your health a priority in grad school. So we're going to start with a poll again. Does anyone, has anyone ever dealt with a serious physical health issue or a mental health issue while in college? A, yes, I've dealt with something physical. Or B, yes, I've dealt with something both physical and mental. Or C, yes, I've dealt with something mental. Or D, no, I really haven't experienced anything mental or anything physical health issue. Um, just want to get an idea. Um, maybe you're blessed and you haven't, you know, had to deal with either of those, and that's great, but... Um, I know I've dealt with a few myself, which I'll go into, but I just wanted to get an idea of where you guys are. So has anyone dealt with a serious physical health issue? And the results are in. No mental or physical health issues, 60% of you. That's awesome. That's phenomenal. Um, yes, mental, 20%. Both physical and mental, 20%. Okay, so... Um, this is something that I don't think is talked about quite often enough, and this is why I wanted to bring it up. Um, we spend so much time studying, and we spend so much time doing our research, but you need to stop and make sure you're taking care of yourself in the process. Um, so a little bit about me. When I was in my master's program in 2015, I started developing a rash that just spread through all my body. Um, I was waking up with a swollen face, hives all over my neck, um, I saw several doctors that didn't really know what to do with me at first, just kept giving me steroids, couldn't really give me an answer. Well, it turned out that it was an autoimmune reaction, and my body was releasing ha massive amounts of hist histamine without um, an allergy. I had no specific allergy. My body was doing this to myself. So that, that stinks. Um, the last thing you want is to be in grad school and be waking up with hives, full body hives. Um, luckily, um, there's this injection called Zolaire, which basically uh, blocks my body from releasing histamine, and it was extremely effective, and I was getting those injections twice a month um, for six months, but it did come with some side effects. Um, 
my hair was falling out at one point. Um, at one point, I got the injection and half my face went numb for about a day. Um, so that was kind of scary. And eventually, I was able to taper off those and my hives haven't come back. But then in 2017, I was feeling really burned out. I was in my PhD program. Um, I was really tired and achy all the time. So I went back to my immunologist. I thought maybe it had something to do with my hives, but this time it was my thyroid. Um, and they diagnosed me with Hashimoto's, which basically means my own body is attacking its own thyroid. So once you have something like Hashimoto's or both two autoimmune diseases, the chances of developing something else increases by 50%. So they tell me I have to go in and get my antibodies checked several times a year because the chances of me getting multiple cirrhosis or lupus or rheumatoid arthritis increases, and that's kind of scary. So I was really confused. I was like, why me? Why am I dealing with all these health issues? All I'm trying to do is get some degrees, and I guess to deal with all these problems. Um, I thought I was pretty healthy. I crossed it. I worked out. I was young. I ate, I ate decently, but I wasn't that strict. Um, and it's hard to really know what triggered the autoimmune responses, but um, I had to start taking account for what I could change, and that was managing my stress, um, really dialing into my nutrition, um, looking into my exercise schedule, vitamins and supplements, and since then I've really seen a huge change in my health. So they don't really know what causes autoimmune diseases. There's a bunch of number of different triggers. It can be genetics or a virus or environmental pollutants or hormonal imbalances or leaky gut, but there's no way for them to be like, this is what's causing it. So I was like, this is even harder. I don't, I don't even know what's causing this, and I'm going to try to figure it out, though. So, you know, what was in my control to change? So the best I could do was learn more about nutrition and what vitamins and supplements I could take. I needed to learn how to manage my stress better because I know I wasn't doing it well. Um, learning to say no and not overloading my schedule. And I think I was over-exercising with the CrossFit, so that did not help. Um, surprisingly, these are some of my numbers, actually. After 2.5 months, um, my thyroid stimulating hormone did go down from 5.58 to 3.99, and actually, last week, I just got my thyroid checked again, and it went to 2.85. So that's, that's awesome. Um, and so I did see improvements when I started to take care of myself. Um, handling stress and feeling burned out is not sustainable. Um, you need sleep, and you need real foods. And sure, you can eat processed foods and not exercise and pull all-nighters, but you're not going to feel great in the process, I can promise you. I've never heard anyone say it. I eat so much processed foods, I don't exercise, I don't sleep, and I feel super healthy. I've never heard anyone say that. So if you're one of those people, let me know, because I need to know what you're doing. So study after study, it's proven that the best, one of the best things you can do is exercise. Um, and I know when I get stressed out, I get very introverted, um, and I'm sure a lot of you do too. Um, and that's when you need to make more of an effort to get out and do something and make that human contact when you least want to do it. So exercise is key, but you should do whatever you like. Exercise should not be a task. You should not be miserable when you're exercising. So whether that's a walk in the park or kicking around the soccer ball, there are so many things you can do, yoga, running, weightlifting. Um, you don't need a gym membership in order to be active. Um, think about it. It's 2018. There are so many Instagram fitness people and YouTubers that have hundreds of videos of workouts that you can do at home with like, I don't know, you see people that do squats with their babies, like you can find anything in your house to work out with. Um, um, also not over exercising is key. Um, I only allow myself to cross it every other day um, because that's what my body responds best to. Um, but I do notice I focus better and I have more energy when I am exercising regularly. So volunteering is fun, um, it's free, and you always feel good afterwards. Um, you can go volunteer at a local shelter, you can feed meal, meals to those in need. Um, animal shelters are great, you can go just spend time with the animals, um, just give them attention. Uh, there are local rescues that have adoption events, and you can just go, um, a lot of rescues need people to help handle the dog. So if they're at an adoption event and they have three dogs, they just need someone there to hold the leash of one of the dogs. And that could be like a community service for one of the Saturdays. Um, Habitat for Humanity is constantly building houses. 
Um, there are many teaching opportunities in your community. Um, I teach um, young girls at a high school in Charlotte about opportunities in STEM when they graduate. Um, so right there is a picture of the foster dogs that I fostered in 2017. Um, I love fostering, but I had to stop fostering because it was too much work and it was way too hard on my body. So that was something where I had to learn how to say no. Um, I love saving dogs. and I have a huge heart for rescuing dogs, but it was too much for me while I was in grad school. So recognizing that is really important. Okay, get out more. I know it's hard. Sometimes, like I said, when you're stressed, you want to stay inside. You want to watch Netflix. But staying at home becomes very comfortable. And the more you stay there, the more you're going to fall into this slump. So you need to find a new activity. Um, you know, do something you've never done before, like a cooking class or go rock climbing. Um, the one benefit to getting out that people always forget about is that's how you network. When you meet people is how you network for new opportunities. Um, it just so happens one of my friends that I went met while I was out, her um, father owned Authentech, which created a fingerprint scanner, which they later sold to Apple. So that's a huge, huge contact I now have in the technology industry. But I never would have had it if I never met my friend and I never would have known her father had was so high up in technology. So um, don't forget that when you go out and when you talk to people, you might stumble into an opportunity that you never expected, and you may also gain some friends along the way. Um, grad school is not meant to be all work and no play. You can enjoy yourself. Um, you do not need to be miserable the entire time you're in school or while you're in undergrad. Um, find a new activity, and you can have a healthy balance. Um, connect with other people in your future career. Um, it's definitely important being in computing and being in science and being in research that you connect with people in that niche because that's where you're going to be for your future career. And this will be great when you want to collaborate in the future. You'll already have people you can work with. Unwind and unplug. So this is really tough because as um, a computational biologist and some of you are computer scientists, um, you spend a lot of time at your computer. I mean, it's attached to everything you do, which is why it's really important to remove yourself away from technology once in a while. So read a book. I recently started going to the public library. Public libraries are great. You can go, you can get 20 different books. If you can grab a book that you don't even know if you want to read, but it's okay because it's free. Um, so I've been going to public library and getting like 20 books on the most random topics, things I just want to learn about, um, health-related books. And I totally forgot about public libraries until a couple months ago. But um, public libraries are great. It's free. Um, take a bath. Listen to a podcast. Um, just take five minutes sometimes to unplug everything and just meditate. Just focus on your breathing and don't do anything. I actually took a four-week meditation class when I was dealing with um, a lot of these health issues. And it was wonderful. And it helped my anxiety a lot. Um, whatever your interest might be, just find it and remove yourself from the rest of the world. Whether um, I really like taking my dogs to the park. I have two of my own dogs. Um, I really enjoy vegetable gardening. I have a vegetable garden, um, playing guitar. Anything that's going to pull you away from technology for a few minutes is going to be really good for you. Okay, poll four. Do any of you follow any diet plans? Do you count macros? So, you know, grams of protein, grams of carbs, grams of fat, or do any of you pay attention to nutrition in general? A, I count macros. B, I follow some type of diet, whatever that diet might be. Or C, I don't really follow anything, but I do try to just generally eat healthy. Or D, I don't pay close attention to what I eat. I just eat whatever is easy. Okay, so... You guys are split. 33% are, um, I follow a diet, or C, I try to eat generally healthy, or D, I don't pay close attention to what I eat. So I'm not going to lie. For the longest time, I was someone that didn't pay attention to what I ate. Um, and people are always like, oh, that's so great. You're not overweight. I wasn't overweight, but it was clearly wreaking havoc in my autoimmune system. So even though I wasn't gaining weight, doesn't mean it wasn't affecting me um, negatively, because it was. Um, the biggest lie, too, is that healthy foods cost too much. It doesn't. Um, you can buy so much food, so much produce with $20. 
Um, there are easy ways to fuel your body with good foods. Uh, meal prepping is a great way. I spend your Sunday just cooking some basic meals. You don't have to prep from Monday through Friday, but if you just prep your breakfast, that might start your week to make better decisions throughout the day. Um, one of my favorite things to use is a crock pot. Get the crock pot out, throw some meat in there, or not meat if you're vegetarian, but throw a bunch of vegetables in there and herbs and seasoning and some chicken broth, and you can just sit it there for four hours, go do your research, go to class, come back, it's cooked. Um, you can cook in slightly bigger batches. Um, don't overdo it, but, you know, if I make a crock pot batch, I'll try to um, cook a couple meals for lunch or dinner the next few days. Um, something else I like to do is I make a big bowl of salad on Sunday, and I eat that salad throughout the week. Um, cut up a melon and square it up into a container and snack on that all week. Um, it's really not hard to eat healthy. Like I said, you don't have to do all those things, but just start incorporating one of those things into your week. As you start to progress, you'll notice a big change in your health and energy when you start eating healthy, I promise you. Um, so fruit, grains, nuts, seeds, fish, meat, vegetables, sprouted grains, just whole real foods. You want to really stay away from the stuff that's processed, that's just empty calories, that's really not feeding your mind or body. So um, nutrition has a huge impact on our hormones, and you'll find a lot of health issues actually stem from people's hormones being imbalanced. Um, unbalanced hormones can cause you to feel tired, upset, and just very emotional. So really tuning into that and um, eating in a way that's going to support your body and what you need to function is really important. Um, fatty acids and omega-3s, these are super important. And I actually took a um, four-day nutrigenetics class with um, UNC Chapel Hill at their Nutrition Research Institute. And um, you can look up a lot of their research that they're doing there at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, they're learning a lot about what, how our everyday nutrition is affecting our genetics. So um, uh, omega-3s and fatty acids play a huge role in cognitive development and help our brains function at what is an optimal level. Um, so fatty acids and omega-3s are in, fit, in uh, fish or like grass-fed meat. Um, so you also want to stay hydrated and avoid any added sugars. Any added sugars are going to spike your blood sugar and then cause you to crash in the long term. Vitamins and supplements. A lot of people are going to tell you that vitamins and supplements should be kept to a minimum because it's really more ideal to get food from a whole source rather than a pill form. It is great for um, targeted areas. Um, I take a supplement specifically for my thyroid because I know um, my thyroid lacks. So targeted supplements are good for areas that you know you might need. Or if you know you have a known deficiency in something, then definitely supplement. If you know you're always low in iron, which a lot of females always are, then start supplementing with iron. You should try to get it from food, but maybe you also need a supplement, and that's okay as well. Um, there, are, you can, there are simple blood tests you can get with your doctor if you um, are afraid some of the, your, low, your levels might be low. Um, but there's no need to kill it with the vitamins. Um, I find like a multivitamin and maybe three to four other specific vitamins um, work well for me. Um, protein shakes are great too when you're always on the go. They're super helpful. Um, I'll tell you what's never a good idea. What's never a good idea is skipping meals. Um, it's not going to help you. It's not going to help your metabolism. It's not going to help your brain. Don't skip meals. If you're really in a rush, protein shake or something. You can get plant-based protein, whey protein, whatever floats your boat. Um, definitely skipping a meal is not optimal. Okay, mental health. So when I was dealing with my thyroid issues and my autoimmune issues, um, the inflammation caused me to feel very sore, very achy, very depressed, very burned out. Um, so just know that if you're dealing with mental health issues, you're not alone. But also keep in mind that mental health issues can be linked to your physical health. So the, the depression I was feeling was linked to my thyroid. So um, always keep that in mind. Like it might be something physically that's also wrong with you. Um, but your school has resources. You're not alone. Um, and something else I learned too when I was dealing with something in grad school is that you have an ombudsman. So an ombudsman is a faculty member that's outside of your department that kind of gives you unbiased guidance and advice. So if you're really dealing with something tragic in grad school, 
you know, whether it's harassment or you think you've been treated unfairly or in my case, you had a tenured professor try to fail you on your PhD qualifying exam unfairly. That happened. Um, you go to this ombudsman and you sit down with them, you tell them what's going on. And it's really good to have one, an outside perspective, but two, if anything escalates and anything goes against you, you now have a witness that's in another faculty area that can stand up on your behalf. Um, they're really great. They're friendly. They're great at um, counseling you and that's what they're there for. So um, if you need advice in a situation like that, seek them out. That's what they're there for. They're also very well equipped on knowing the policies of you know, the school and everything else and can give you more resources if that's what you need. Um, make a friend. Whether you wanna talk to everyone or no one, that's fine, but make at least one friend because everyone needs at least somebody in their program. Um, whether you're having trouble with homework or tests or things like that, it, it can really go a long way to have just one person you trust. Um, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The number is 1-800-273-8255. Use it. If there's ever a time you need it, that's what it's there for. 24 hours, seven days a week, no matter what. Poll five. Um, I'm just wondering, how many of you have sought out any school resources when dealing with mental health issues and felt they were helpful? Um, a, I sought out school resources, but they were not helpful. B, I did not seek out school resources when dealing with mental health issues. C, I sought out school resources and they were helpful. Or D, I feel like I got more help and support from friends and family than school resources. Um, I ask this because I have heard a few people tell me that school resources were not helpful to them. Um, so I was really just curious on if anyone else has experienced that. And that is a shame. 67% um, of you guys said you sought out school resources and they were not helpful. Um, I wish I knew how to address this better, but clearly it's an issue. Um, I feel like I got more help and support from friends and family than from school, 33% of you said. Um, this is a huge issue. And I mean, I hopefully as um, we continue addressing mental health and keep pushing for more resources. Um, I hope it will get better. Um, but it's a shame that a lot of people don't find them helpful. Um, just realize that you are important and you have a purpose. You've gotten to where you are because you're gifted and you're talented in that area. Um, you can have the power to change research and the future through your research. Um, right now I'm looking at inflammation and essential oils and one of the next stages we're looking at now is drug targeting to see if these essential oils can be effective in a drug-like setting. Um, so this could be useful if it goes farther. Um, so you can be a light for someone else that's also struggling. So also keep that in mind. You might not think of it, but there might be someone looking up to you right now. So, um, and also realize no one can take better care of yourself than yourself. Um, so always advocate for yourself. Um, and if you're dealing with any issues, also communicate with your professors. I know it can be intimidating, but your professors are really real people and most of them are really cool and chill. They're very flexible, um, but if they can't help you if you don't communicate with them. So if you're having trouble with a mental health issue or a physical health issue and you can't get to your assignments on time, a lot of them will be more flexible with you, but you have to communicate that with them. They do want to see you succeed. They don't want to see you fail. Um, so communicating that is really important. Questions? Thank you very much for sharing your personal story. It means a lot to other people to hear other people's personal stories. Um, I, I guess one question is a lot of us kind of know we should be doing the right things with nutrition, but it, the question is how to get started and how to stay with it. Do you have suggestions for that? Um, I think starting is always the small changes that you can make. So instead of going for a bag of chips, why don't you just start going for the fruit instead? You know, it's these small changes. Um, when you get up for breakfast, you know, I think meal prepping has made my life a lot easier to eat healthy. So something I do, for example, is um, on Sunday I'll cook a bunch of eggs and a bunch of bacon, turkey bacon, regular bacon, and I just put it in a container. 
and I eat that every day before I start my day. Um, and yeah, that's a little bit of work, but to be honest, my mornings have gotten so much better by having real sustainable food in my stomach when I start my day. Um, cause a lot of times, a lot of us skip breakfast. Um, so sometimes seeing the reward and how much it's helping you physically might make you want to continue doing it. Um, but the only thing you can do is small changes. So maybe, yeah, you're at the grocery store, opt for a salad instead of, you know, the hot dog or the burger. Um, try to eat more just nutrient dense foods. You know, what am I going to get out of a bag of chips versus a small chicken salad? You know, it's a big difference. So just try making small changes there, and that's where you'll really start to see a difference. Mm -hmm. So my daughter is a, a registered um, dietitian. So she tells me to stay on the outside of the store and don't enter the right. inside for all the bad stuff. Is. Exactly. Yeah, that one's a great one. It's um, do all your shopping around the outside. Yeah. So like freezer, produce, meat, dairy, and that's about it. And then all the inside, they just. Right. So a lot of those things that you talked about were um, – kind of getting yourself out there and just doing something active. Um, what about the person who says, well, I'm an introvert. I don't, I can't picture myself out there doing these things by myself, but I have trouble making friends. How am I going to do this? Right. Um, so I think I, I get the introvert person. Like I do, I get it. Cause sometimes I can get really introverted. I can be very extroverted. I can be very introverted. So um, when I stress out, I get very introverted, and all I want to do is sit inside and watch Netflix and this and that. Um, and luckily now my friends know me well enough that they're like, Anita, you're doing this on purpose. You are you need to get out the house. Um, but I think volunteering is probably one of the great um, – is a great way to get out if you're nervous. Um, you're not really obligated to have to interact with those people, but just you can – and you might meet a friend along the way um, – I also teach at Children's Hospital over here in Charlotte. So um, one of my friends that I met while I was on a shift there actually ended up being one of my really good friends now. Um, so I went to volunteer, and I went for a different purpose to help, you know, children and teach them. But along the way, I met a friend. So um, I think volunteering is a great way to get out there. Um, you have a purpose. You're doing something for being there. And you might actually meet some really good friends along the way. So. Mm -hmm. And usually, like, UNC Charlotte, I know, has, like, a bunch of volunteer opportunities always um, posted. So, and you will not be the only one that goes there and shows up by themselves, because I do it all the time. So, um, typically, when you do stuff with, like, your university, you'll also meet other people on your campus there that are also volunteering. So, yeah, I think a lot of the campuses have some kind of office that tries to uh, connect students to the community and various volunteer um, opportunities for them. So you, 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 uh, somebody, you could look up people on your campus and find out which office will help you connect yeah. it to that community because you probably didn't grow up in that community. You might not know where, where those things are. So that's great. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I think we're going to move on. Do you want to move? Move this to the next slide. I'd um, like to talk about um, CRAW. So we want to thank Anita for her research, her great research talk, and for sharing her personal story in the uh, um, on how, how to uh, get yourself out there and treat yourself well while you're in graduate school. Um, so CRAW is an organization that does a whole lot more than just the virtual town halls. We have a lot of other programs, so we really encourage you, if you haven't gone to the CRAW site, to go to the website and see what some of the other programs are for undergraduates, graduate students, faculty, people out in industry. So whatever stage you're in, there's programs out there for you. Um, the other thing we really like you to do is to complete the survey. This survey helps us after these uh, webinars to actually um, be the the um, to, to actually figure out what kinds of speakers do we want and what kinds of topics you'd like to hear, what kind of mentoring topics. So please fill out the survey. 
So at this time, we're going to thank Anita, and we're going to move into an online question and answer. Um, so we really encourage the participants to stay on and go ahead and type in questions. Either uh, Really, you could ask her just about anything about her research, her background, how she got to where she is, um, uh, anything about the mentoring topic that she uh, talked about. So please send your questions, and Anita and I will start answering. So thank you very much for joining the webinar. And we're going on to an online forum now.